I'm Pat Doris. Welcome to the story. All the ways to contact us right there at the bottom of your screen, and we do want to hear from you. You can email the story at kgw.com or call us and leave a voicemail 503-226-5090. I'm here in front of City Hall because it's time to talk to Portland's mayor. We're going to have a wide range in conversation. We're going to talk about everything from gun violence to homelessness to the future of the city, the city's charter, and also the comeback of Portland. Thanks for being here. It's Thanks always, for having me. Appreciate always nice that. to be able to talk with you. Um, violence, big topic on the community's mind. I was checking the call logs last night. I believe there were five shootings between roughly nine o'clock and 10 o'clock. What do you make of that? Well, there's no question. We're, we're experiencing an epidemic of gun violence and homicides in this city. And it's not unique to Portland, but I really don't care what's happening elsewhere. I'm concerned about the escalation in gun violence here. And as a result of that, I think we've taken some solid steps in recent months. We have the focused intervention team now out there working to prevent and intervene in gun violence. That's a branch of the Portland Police Bureau. They now work alongside the new enhanced community safety team. That's 22 officers, sergeants, and lieutenants who focus on investigative follow-up. Importantly, we also have tighter relationships with both the district attorney as well as our federal partners to make sure that people who are engaged in these activities are prosecuted. I will say this, I expect gun violence to escalate this summer as it typically does during the summer months and my team and I will be monitoring it. And if we need to add additional officers to the focused intervention team, I'll be prepared to do so. I know we've asked before and the answer has been no, but was it a mistake to make the gang enforcement team go away because you had to recreate it? Well, we'll know. Um, the, the good news is we will be able to tell. If the reassemblage of this new team, the focused intervention team, which, which frankly I think is enhanced in terms of its capacity to intervene and prevent gun violence. If we start to see the numbers drop off quickly, we'll know that that was the reason. I and others have been critical in the past that you and the police chief don't go to some of the big murder scenes. Is there a reason you don't go to them? I mean, why not say this is important to me and to the city and I'm here? Pat, I love you, but that's just flat out wrong. I have gone to those scenes as recently as, what, uh, two, three weeks ago, I was in Dawson's Park. Um, I, I do go. I don't go to all of them, but I do go. And the reason I don't go to all of them is once the scene is secured, that is a live investigative crime scene. And having an elected official tooling around there isn't necessarily the best thing for the investigative follow-up. But I have attended. I've spoken to family members. I've spoken to people who've been directly impacted. And uh, I have always put out the word that if family members want to talk to me, I am always available. And a number of them have taken me up on that. Okay, homeless issues. Public very much fired up about that. Uh, you've, as you mentioned, had to take some emergency orders to try and streamline and centralize things. How do you think that's going? I think it's going really well. Um, the uh, first emergency directive that I passed was to remove people from high crash corridors, dangerous locations where it just isn't safe to pitch a tent. And I will say that we just went by the Powell Boulevard off-ramp from 205 where someone was killed a couple of months ago up on the shoulder there. Uh, and there's maybe one tent, but there used to be a lot more. So we have seen some progress there. Yeah, and, and we'll, uh, part of the difference is we're actually going to go back and we're going to make sure that those sites are maintained. Uh, so thanks for the insight. Um, but it's not safe. I mean, just a few weeks ago in Salem, a number of people were killed when a car ran off the road and went right through a homeless camp. That, that is proof that moving people out of those high crash corridors makes sense, even though I obviously took a lot of heat for it. The second directive was also really important. That's around making sure that we can site sanctioned, managed camps quickly as opposed to uh, having to go through all kinds of hoops and hurdles that, that we typically do today. And the third was to, and probably the most important and the least talked about, was to create a war room, to create a street services coordination center where all of our city bureaus come together every day 
and talk about where the hot spots are and where we need to intervene and where we need to clean up, where we need to remediate, and where we need to connect people with services. And that is already um, in the works. That's going to be launched next week, is my understanding, and I expect that to have a huge impact, just in terms of how the city addresses homelessness issues. How about uh, downtown? Still boarded up windows? City employees are somewhat slow to come back. Are you satisfied with the pace of recovery here? I'd like it to be faster, to be honest. I, I wish that there were more people coming downtown more quickly. That includes city employees, but, but I understand the reluctance of people to do that. On the other hand, uh, I have been downtown for the last several days. It has been very busy downtown. Foot traffic is clearly picking up. Uh, it is still hard to find a parking place in downtown Portland. And if you want to come into town this weekend and eat at a restaurant, you better have a reservation because they're going to be packed. There's a lot going on, and we've seen a lot of big activities of late. Uh, the Winter Lights Festival was hugely successful. Uh, we've seen other big events here in the city of Portland be very successful. So I'm, I'm confident we're on the road to recovery. And why not bring the city employees back earlier? Why not a month ago? Well, they're unionized. And so this, is, this isn't this uh, is a decision that I get to make by fiat as mayor. This is a negotiation that we have with our collective bargaining units. We now have a scaled approach for people to return to the city of Portland. I've also offered some ideas around incentivizing our employees to come back earlier and in larger numbers. And I'll be making some announcements about that soon. Uh, but I would like to see the city lead. It's important for people to see that the city is confident and has uh, uh, hope for the future of this city. That will help encourage the private sector to do its thing. And thanks to Mayor Wheeler for talking with me. By the way, when he, we talked about the charter and the future of the city, he said he supports any charter reform, that anything is better than what we have now. I look forward to doing interviews like that more often with the mayor. Since it's Friday, let's switch from the serious to something that's a bit more fun. Let's talk about geographic names that trip up lots and lots of folks, including me sometimes. We know that there are lots of them out there, and we've asked you to send us your ideas, typical, typical things, and besides that, that people trip on. Well, we got lots of suggestions and also corrections, and you continue to let us know when we get names wrong, like Martha, who sent us this email after a story about the town of Alsi. She wrote that the Al is pronounced as in Allen. You're pronouncing it as in all, she said. Sorry about that. Thanks for that, Martha. That one is not always easy to remember, and it did get us thinking about all the other names in Oregon that people have trouble with. Listen, we know it's not easy, I've heard it pronounced Wilmet. I've heard it pronounced Wilmet. I've heard it pronounced Willamette. The way to remember it, of course, is Willamette, damn it. But it's not always clear. Scapoose, not scapoose. And honestly, sometimes even the locals don't agree. Langlois. 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 Langlois fan. Langlois. Langlois. Like, is it Albina or Albina? The actually correct pronunciation was Albina. It's named after a woman. Her name was Albina Page. I had no idea. And are there more that we've been pronouncing wrong? I believe that uh, Gleason, uh, this is the way people pronounce it here, was originally Gleason. It's universally uh, said as, as Gleason. But the actual name of the fellow, Rodney Glisson. There are a lot of names around here that can be pretty tricky. The, D-H-E, separate word, D-A-L-L-E-S. Everybody wants to say Dallies, or they want to just cut it short to Dallas. And if you're new here, sometimes you gotta wonder, are the locals just trolling me? Because yes, this word is couch, but... Looks like couch, but it is uh, cooch. Thing we can all agree on though, nothing riles up an Oregonian more than... A lot of folks back east, it's, it's Oregon. Then there are the ones that are spelled the same, but pronounced differently depending on where you are. The headquarters of the Coquel tribe uh, sits in North Bend, Oregon, which is about 
25 miles uh, north of the town of Coquille. The town itself was pronounced Coquille for many, many years, and it wasn't until later that it became Coquille. For the Coquille tribe, the pronunciation is an effort to take back their tribal identity after termination. When we realized all of this history of Coquell, we thought, wouldn't it be cool if we actually pronounced our name the way that it was intended to be pronounced? Coquell tribal members today both pronounce the word Coquell and Coquille. Here in the KGW Newsroom, when we need to know how to pronounce a name, we go to the guy who stares at maps all day. Yahat. Right about there. Alsi, also right in there on the coast. Clatskanai, which is up on the Columbia River. Aloha, Washington County. Molino County. Oh, you dropped one. Tumalo. Some people say Tumalo. I've heard both, but I usually go with Tumalo. And there's a Tumalo Mountain down near Bend. There's also a little town called Tumalo. Terrebonne, which translates to the beautiful land. And that is in Central Oregon as well, near Redmond. Wallawa, which is in Northeast Oregon. There's a mountain range. There's also the little town of Wallawa. Lebanon, which is down the valley, kind of northeast of Eugene. Maupin, over on the Deschutes River in Eastern Oregon, right about in there. Chiloquin, which is down in Southern Oregon, north of Klamath Falls and south of, north of Klamath Falls and south of Chimult. Vida, which is in the valley. And Thai Valley, which is over on the east side of Mountain Hood. Shanico, also on the east side of Mountain Hood, near what used to be known as Antelope, which later became Rajneesh Piram, where the Rajneeshis were doing their thing. This is Owyhee, which is down in southeast Oregon. Way down here, there's the Owyhee River and the Owyhee Mountains. Jervis, also in the Willamette Valley. And Philomath, which is near Corvallis, also in the valley here, home of Western, White, Western Oregon University, I believe. No, that's Monmouth. Sorry, <laughs> you, you got me on that one. All right, that's Sio, the C is silent. And Willamina, also in the Willamette, Will, Willamette Valley, of course. And that is Adana, which is over in Northeast Oregon. As a little flashcard quiz there for Matt Safino at the end. He does not miss anything. Nice job to Ashley Koch, our producer who put that whole story together. Did we miss any hard to pronounce names? Let us know. Speaking of names, a number of places in Washington state are now being renamed because they contain a word used as a racist and sexist slur against Native American women. We do want to warn you that the offensive word is used in this next story. Some of the landmarks are being renamed, and some are in southwest Washington, by the way. Drew Mickelson has a look at that process and how it's happening in Washington state. The word's been taken out of location names before. Here on the Evergreen State College campus, Bushu Wa'ali Point used to be Squaw Point. It may just be one word, but for many, it's a significant one. Like listening to the birds and and hearing the wind go through the tree. So I love visiting places like this. Generations ago, this land belonged to Charlene Kreiss' ancestors, those of the Squaxin Island tribe. While this is now property of the Evergreen State College, in 2011, the college restored the point's original name, replacing that one word. To some people, no big deal, but to us as tribal women, it was a big deal because it talks about a personal place on a, a woman's body that is, should be treated with discretion. U.S. Secretary of the Interior Deb Holland, the first Native American to hold that post, declared the word derogatory and ordered it removed from 650 location names across the country, including 18 spots in counties across Washington state lakes, creeks, peaks, and valleys. A state committee on geographic names is now taking public input for replacement names. We want to commemorate indigenous women on the landscape. That's really important to all of us. We're all very committed to that. It's not just for the Native American sake, but it's for the sake of all young women and women. Charlene Kreiss is thankful that a hurtful label from the past has no future here. We all are here on this earth because of a, uh, our blessed mothers and 
in honor of making sure that we have that respect, it's so good to know that these name changes are happening. That was Drew Mickelson reporting. Oregon is one of several states that have already passed legislation banning the word squaw from place names. We like to focus on solutions to our homeless crisis, so let's learn more about a Portland group that helps people living on the street get jobs and get into housing. From being sleeping in a tent to having a 40 hour a week job to having an apartment, paying rent, yeah, just absolutely amazing. Plus, here are the temperatures along the coastal stations today. You wanted us to dig an old weather forecast out of the KGW vault, so we went all the way back to the 1950s. We're seeing the first signs of a change here in the uh, Pacific Northwest. But when the story continues. Welcome back. Keep sending questions and comments to the story at KGW.com or give us a call. Leave us a voicemail at 503-226-5090. For example, what would you think of what uh, Portland's mayor had to say? Send us some emails. Let us know about that. All this week, we've been raising money under the Hey Help banner for a group called Cultivate Initiatives. Well, tonight we're going to go out to visit them at one of their work sites. And if you'd like to donate while watching the story, you can go to KGW.com slash Hey Help. On the Springwater Corridor at Southeast Foster Boulevard, it's cleanup time at one of the many homeless camps. The men and women who make up this crew work for Cultivate Initiatives. It's a nonprofit dedicated to helping people who are homeless get back on their feet. The nonprofit is funded by the metro area supportive housing tax on high income earners and companies. One of the workers here is Joseph Ahern. <laughs> I've been homeless for a long, like 16 years, like a long time, 16 years or so. He goes by Jay. Jay used to camp along the Springwater Trail here. It's, it's pretty cool actually on the trail, actually. <laughs> this is a good place to camp though. Yeah. It really is. He learned about Cultivate Initiatives from a friend and showed up for a temporary work shift that paid about 60 bucks a day. Now he works full time here. The nonprofit would not share his wage, but did say their pay ranges from 20 to $34 an hour. Matt McCarl is the community engagement and action coordinator for the nonprofit. It's, yeah, it's exciting because it's, it's these folks are they're doing the work we're just we're supporting along the way and you know removing barriers as they come up and so that's where we can really step in but like he's paying the rent we're not you know he's he's the one showing up before me sometimes to work and so um yeah it's really cool to just be able to come alongside folks and support One, two, three, let's go. Besides cleaning up camps, Cultivate Initiatives has a mobile hygiene and shower team for the homeless and a workforce development program and a remodeling group as well. All of it focused on helping people get off the street. Jay said it's made an amazing difference for him. Just somebody give me a second chance. So just let me shine the way it is, just let me do what I've always known I had the capability of, but somebody just gave me a chance to just show it. Now he's part of a crew helping clean up the community and he's no longer living in a tent or emergency shelter. Now, he has his own apartment. Yeah, I paid my first, first month's rent this time. It was exciting, I'm sure that'll wear off really quick, but 
It, it was exciting to do that for the first time in a long time. Yeah, yeah. Nice to see a program that really is helping. Here's another way to give to Cultivate Initiatives. Just hold up your phone's camera to the QR code on your screen. It will take you to a donation link. Or you can go to kgw.com slash heyhelp. By the way, this is a micro donation drive, so feel free to give any amount, no matter how small or how big. Oregon has a mental health crisis and a big one. I don't think there's anyone out there that would disagree. Many of us have stories of someone in our family or our community who've struggled, and you've likely seen someone on the street in crisis. Research shows just how bad it is, by the way. A national health report showed nearly 35% of Oregonians reported symptoms of mental health disorders last fall. That's 3% above the national average. Mental Health America ranked Oregon dead last for access to care based on the prevalence of mental illness. Now, we know that mental health disorders can affect anyone at any time, and they're a big driver in leading people to homelessness and keeping them there. We get a lot of emails and voicemails about this, including this one from Michelle, who said, I have not heard one person mention mental health or addiction treatment. Whether we build housing for the homeless or put them in large shelters, the problem itself is never going to improve if we don't first invest in mental health and addiction services. Well, good news. In the past legislative session, that actually did happen. Lawmakers passed the biggest investment into mental health care in Oregon state history, $1.25 billion. That's a ton of money. It'll go towards things like creating more residential facilities, expanding community behavioral health facilities, which help people regardless of their insurance coverage, and millions of dollars will be focused on hiring more health care workers in the mental health space. This week on Straight Talk, Laurel Porter interviewed two of the Oregon lawmakers who helped pass that funding. It's historic. And I, 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 we're going to use that word probably too much, but it is really um, important uh, for viewers to understand that we have made an investment that has never been made at this level uh, into, this, into the system not only into our mental health system, but we've made historic investments in substance use disorder treatment, as well as housing. And when I look at this problem, I call it my three-legged stool. You have to invest in substance use uh, treatment, mental health treatment, and housing. And if you don't invest in all three of those, you have a wobbly stool or a stool that falls over. Mental health treatment is a complex problem. We didn't get here overnight and we're not going to fix it overnight. But lawmakers say they do expect changes to be implemented starting this summer. And they're asking mental health organizations to bring them their ideas. They're already putting some new pilot programs into place to help people out of crisis. You can hear more about those and how lawmakers are planning to measure whether any of it's working tonight on Straight Talk at 7 o'clock. That's with Laurel Porter. You can also watch it on our KGW YouTube page. When we come back, you asked for it and we found it. We'll travel back in time to one of the earliest weather forecasts we could find. It certainly looks a lot different than what Matt Zafino does today. We'll check it out when we return.
One of our most popular segments is the KGW Vault. It's priceless, and we love it when you email in your suggestions to the story at KGW.com. Here's one we got from Larry. He wrote, how about showing a weather forecast from the 1950s or 60s? Great idea, Larry. Our forecasting technology has certainly come a long way since then. Here's a clip we found from 1959, featuring KGW's very first meteorologist, Jack Capel. A heavy showers. One of those heavy showers occurred this afternoon at Marquette, Michigan, where over two inches of rain occurred in a two-hour period. Down at Bird, Texas, nearly 10 inches of rain has occurred in the last three days. Just south of Montgomery, Alabama today, a tornado was sighted by a pilot. If you uh, see something missing on our map here tonight, you notice the Oregon Centennial wagon train isn't there anymore. We have it on our Oregon map tonight, and we'll look at it in just a moment. We're seeing the first signs of a change here in the uh, Pacific Northwest, but first let's look at the pattern that prevailed today. Here is the high pressure extending just to the northwest of us, air moving down toward the low pressure to the east, which is caused by the heating over the interior valleys. Heat lows, not storm lows. The air coming in from the northwest is bringing a little marine air into the local area, enough to cause some brief morning cloudiness, but the high pressure area is a very warm one, and the high temperatures continue. Out here in the ocean, there is a traveling disturbance now. It looks stronger than anything, anything we've seen on our map for about two weeks. It does appear to be traveling eastward, and it will knock down this high pressure to the northwest of us. It will return the winds out over the ocean to a more westerly direction. In other words, it will drive the ocean air more directly into the local area. That won't happen for about two days. It should be here by Friday, though, and that should mean at least a temporary end to our warm spell. So far, we don't see any rain in sight, but it does look like a little cooler weather coming up after this uh, frontal system arrives in the Pacific Northwest. The barometer reading 29.88 inches corrected to sea level. It's rising a little now. It was falling during the afternoon with the high temperatures. Freezing level, 15,200 feet as reported over Salem this afternoon. Columbia Lightship west, northwest, 12 miles an hour. Waves are five feet high. Winds along the coast tomorrow, mostly northwest, 10 to 20 miles an hour except up to about 25 on the south coast. Coastal weather, sunny in the afternoon. After morning cloudiness, temperatures 67 to 70 degrees in the afternoon. Here are the temperatures along the coastal stations today, 67 at Astoria. And over the interior, one of the interesting ones, 97 at Salem. 93 here at the official Channel 8 weather station in downtown Portland, 92 at the airport, 105 at the Dalles east of the Cascades, 101 at Redmond, and 103 at the Dalles forecast for tomorrow and for Thursday then is for sunny after some brief morning cloudiness. Lows at night 58 degrees. The highs tomorrow 90 except near 94 Salem to Eugene. On Thursday a little more westerly winds with marine air coming in cooler about 88 degrees. Back to Ivan in just a moment after this from Household Finance Corporation. Jack Capel, what a legend. And of course it was hot in the Dalles back then. It's always hot in the Dalles in the summer. Some of you probably remember watching Jack. He worked at KGW from the day the station went on the air in 1956 all the way until the year 2000. I had the privilege of working with him for 10 years during that time. All right, keep sending your questions and comments to the story at KGW.com. We'll wrap things up right after this.
Congratulations for making it to Friday. Thanks for spending time with us. That's the end of our show. Thanks for watching. Remember the story, our story, that never ends. I'll see you on Monday.